Greetings, my name is Ian Marks. I'm a contributing writer for American Cinematographer Magazine. And welcome to the Canon Creative Studio at the Sundance Film Festival 2021. I'm here with Martin DeChico and Daniel Claridge, uh, the cinematographers for the documentary film Searchers, premiering Saturday, January 30th in the festival's next section. Martin and Daniel, thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, the two of you are documentary filmmakers. Well, let me back up, sorry. Uh, before we start talking about uh, searchers, uh, I wanna talk to you a little bit about um, your uh, documentary work as uh, filmmakers and directors in your own right. Um, and just to kind of start it off with like a general question, um, what is it about a subject that makes you want to pursue making a documentary about it? I, well, I, I can start. I mean, I so I I always feel that in both fiction and in in documentary that um, I, I'm always attracted to subjects that want something. To put it to put it very clearly, so um, uh, certainly in a film like The Searchers, this was literalized in the sense that these are people who want to find love, and it's various. Uh, forms in New York City but certainly in the work that I've I've done prior to this um with Pacho the director of searchers and and by myself I've always been attracted to a, a kind of a kind of obsession or a kind of um desire to achieve something which may may or may not be completely explicable to other people but it's it's sort of the process of, of explaining and empathizing with that desire that has always appealed to me in, in filmmaking. Pardon? Yeah, I think that, I think that um, it's, it's at least we both have, have directed films. It's at least something that you get an idea about something um, and you can't stop thinking about it. And I think maybe, um, there's a little bit of like self-importance involved in like thinking the film, but maybe that comes along later. I think that you just keep thinking about this idea. Um, I've never written a, sc a screenplay or done any screenwriting for fiction films, but I imagine that it must be the same thing. You get some kind of nugget of idea and then you can't stop thinking about it. So then you start to flesh it out. And I think that, I mean, with a documentary film, it's basically the same thing. You have some sort of idea, whether it's super abstract or, or super um, fine, let's say it's about one type of person. Um, and you kind of get up, yeah, like Daniel said, you get obsessed with it and you, and then some, that grip it has on you, you decide to make a film about it. Mm -hmm. And Martin, since, you know, um, we're talking to you, um, uh, once you have that idea, uh, what's the next step that you take um, into um, exploring it in a in a in a in a film? Um, well, I don't know about other people, but um, certainly with with um, my practice as a director and a cinematographer, I would say both things happen for documentaries, which is uh, an in, in, an intense amount of research. Um, so you have an idea about something, whether that be the film you're going to be directing or whether that's you're brought on to kind of just do the visuals of it. You obviously have some idea about how you're going to do the visuals. And for me, it's about like reading a whole bunch of stuff on the internet and looking for visual references and, and that type of thing. And for my films that I've done on for my own, but then I think for, for many other people as well that I've just shot on, it's a lot of like, um, it's a lot of days that you're not really on the project, but you're sitting at home trying to get into rabbit holes, I think. Like you're trying to get buried and lost inside stuff that is inspiring you to like go in one direction or another in, in the directing or in the, in, in the cinematography of it. Um, so I would say that the next step is like, I don't know, one, two years of just reading. Daniel? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm 
it, I guess it depends on the project, but I, I find, I find that I like to sort of spend time in a space and, and with a person. So um, it may be in some ways I'm, I'm a bit the opposite in that I like to get out there as soon as possible. This is speaking about my directing work and, um, and sort of iterate, you know, with, with the camera and sort of explore the different ways in which, you know, the camera can capture what's, what's going on. Um, so yeah, I, I tend to, I tend to think that it's, it's like, for me, it's, it's about being in a space and actively doing the thing and, and looking at what's come of it in the edit suite and then modifying from there. Mm -hmm. Do you feel it's better to have like a fixed idea going into a project or, um, or is it better to be open-minded, let's say, um, about, about, about the ideas that you have? I, I think in, again, to speak, to speak about my, my work and, and some of my work with Pacho too, I think like it's, it's obviously a combination of going in with a, a with an idea of what, what you want to do or what you want to convey, but I'm always open to like figuring out some sort of central kind of formal conceit. You know, I'm always kind of open to like, what is, what is going to be the hook, the visual hook that will like make this story sort of pop or allow us to tell this in kind of a novel way. So I'm always looking for like that intersection between the content and the form and hoping that they each inform one another. And for me, that's hard to bake up in the abstract. It's sort of this process of like getting in there and beginning to experiment a bit. Yeah, I would say that, um, I mean, I, I definitely um, do a lot of what Daniel was saying um, about getting into a space and feeling that and smelling it. And I think that especially if, I, I think a lot of films are quite often about like one person. So you you have this one idea about one person, let's say that you're gonna be filmed. Um, but in fact, like we're so many different layers of good and bad and, and, and black, white and gray and everything in between. And, and I think that once you hang out with that person long enough, you're gonna to start to see the, your percept your, um, your, your, your preconceived notions change and that has to go you have to reflect that in your filmmaking too. So I think, yeah, go ahead and like start filming with the person, but be prepared for that to change. And what you thought that person was is definitely gonna change. And if you're not open to that, then I don't know, maybe, yeah. You're, maybe you should change your direction of, of how you're going. Yeah. Do you, does, that, does that direction, does that approach change from like, project to project. Um, I think about like that quote from Werner Herzog, you know, where he's like, no, no, you can't be a fly on the wall. You have to be a hornet. You have to get there and sting. And it's like, well, you know, that's, that might work for some people or for, for some subjects, but not everybody wants to get stung. Uh, yeah. I mean, here's <laughs> the thing. Like if like, yeah, I, I, it's, it's so funny. You could have like a whole class about like a whole debate about like, taking things that Werner Herzog says you should do and, <laughs> and like debating about whether you should be doing that or not. Yeah. I'm all for many of the things he says. I think in this particular, like in this particular saying about being the Hornet, a lot of the time you're going into people's houses that have never been on camera, at least mm -hmm. in my experience, especially outside of the US where people are not so much involved in seeing, um, I don't know, not everyone has been on a reality show and, and, and you're gonna get kicked out of a house if you're gonna be a hornet, you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need to, I would say this, yes, I totally agree, not all films should be fly on the wall. I'm a big proponent of being the fly on the wall without a camera before you start shooting. Go right. be the fly on the wall, go spend a lot of time with the person you're gonna be shooting with, but don't bring a camera into the mix on day one. You need to be able to, 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 to gain their trust as a human before anything else. Once you bring the camera up, that trust of being a human is, is pretty much gone and you have to start again. But at least you had that backbone of being a human that connected with them before. Then you can be the hornet, I guess. And then when you become the hornet, you're either going to get kicked out of their house or not. Um, 
Well, I guess I wasn't looking for so much a comment on 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 you know his on on his perspective, but just to, as a as a way of like illustrating of like how um, you know you can one could take different approaches to the process and how that might change you know from subject to subject or from you know idea to idea. Yeah, and it, I mean, obviously, it completely depends on the on the project too. I mean, uh, you know, I. Um, you know, I, I worked on a feature, I directed, co-directed a feature that was about a, a guy who was sort of running this um, rogue investigation into the, the Queen of Iran's stolen art. And that film was very much about this kind of confrontation between us, the documentary filmmakers and the subject, trying to drill down to sort of like what, what the bedrock reality was surrounding this, this sort of fantasy. And so that was an instance where like it called for a more aggressive approach in certain instances, but um, certainly on a film like the one that we're talking about today, Searchers, it was, it was a, a different kind of approach um, and certainly, certainly far less aggressive in that sense. So, uh, you know, it, it completely depends often on the reaction you're trying to get out of a subject or what the aim of the film is in, in the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Um, well, let's, let's turn to searchers. Um, and I want to know when, when, um, when Pacho was looking for a cinematographer, what was it that he was looking for specifically? And, and, and what do you think it was that he, he saw in you and in your work, excuse me, <laughs> um, that, that led to, to you joining the, joining the production? And you go way uh, back. Yeah, I mean, I go back with Patra. We've we've collaborated on a, a variety of projects. Uh, often, I'm in the capacity as, as a as a cinematographer, but we've co-directed some things too. Um, and yeah, I think I think I just Patra and I have rehearsed the collaboration a few times, and I have a I've developed a, a pretty strong sense of his intuitions rhythmically and, and visually. Um, I, the, the last film we worked on was was. A, a film of his called American Sector, which was different. It was about it was pieces. It was about pieces of the Berlin Wall in the United States being displayed in museums and private residences. But it was similarly sort of meditative, and it was filmed very deliberately. And I think it's I think part of the intuition is having a sense for what is dramatic within the within the sort of more rule bound world of this kind of like structuralist way of thinking about filmmaking. And, um, and then I think just like dispositionally, I'm, I'm game for sort of like a, a, a no frills kind of mode of filmmaking as I think you are too, Martin. So I think that, that partially appeals to Pacha that we're kind of game to try things and to work with a small crew and hopefully people consider us to be, uh, polite team members as well. So that, that helps. When you say structuralist filmmaking, what do you mean? Well, I just mean filmmaking that has a kind of a, a more, a more rule bound um, visual language um, that, you know, so it's, is, uh, you know, is, is sort of not, not in the language of verite or um, other kinds of sort of more, open modes of filmmaking. Uh, yeah. Mm. And can you unpack that as far, um, can, you, can you unpack the sort of the structure of, of searchers? Sorry, search, uh, the searchers, sorry. I keep on wanting to say searching. Um, can, you, can you unpack a little bit the, um, the structure of, of searchers? Sure, I guess what I mean to say is that searchers is a film that was shot in this very sort of ordered manner. It's at some point early on, we realized that the way the film was gonna work is we were gonna see some number of people browsing their, their dating profiles. And so the way it was shot for the most part with the exception of some of the uh, observational interludes that Martin beautifully captured was uh, um, you know, was to film with individuals for like 15 to 30 minutes in a very similar kind of way, similar setups, similar focal lengths. So that's what I sort of mean by, by structuralist. There was a kind of, um, 
there was a kind of rule rule boundness to the to yeah. the filmmaking. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look at um, you know some of Pacho's la last films, I mean, there is sort of a rule that um, guides how the visuals are, right? I mean, if you look at um, American Sector, is obviously it's. I think that that Pacho and Courtney were were going to places they had never been before, and the the you know the tendency would be like let's just start filming with these people that have a piece of the Berlin Wall, but because they were shooting sixteen, it's like they're not just going to be spraying around. You know, the the lens is not going to be spraying it down, right? They're not going to be capturing whatever happens, right? Because they only have so much film. So I think that that lent them sort of an intention of how do we shoot each piece of the Berlin Wall in the same way across America, in the same way that, um, I don't know, when that, did that film come out? 2013, Mana Kamana, Mana Kamana. his film with Stephanie. Um, the film that they made was, was, The Conceit is totally a structuralist film. I mean, it's, it's completely based upon 60 millimeter camera is mounted in this, this gondola that goes over and it's, the exact time length is the length of a four and a foot mag. And so in that sense, it's like, what does unfold from there? So um, I think that, um, Daniel, you had said something really nice that I liked about with searchers, how you and come up with this way of, of filming, which was, I mean, look like everyone thinks that it, let's say this fly on the wall, since we already talked about it, like if we're watching people browse their dating profiles, the fly on the wall image, and I'll use because we're using a, a camera here on in this interview, it won't work for the audio, but a fly on the wall would be, you're seeing me going through my phone, right? But I think the kind of genius thing that you and Pacho came up with, Daniel, was that they'd be looking at the profile and swiping like this, right? And I think that this was some, I really like what you had said about this, Daniel, you said that you had at the beginning of the film had had done a whole bunch of different setups and tried to figure out which was the best. And you said that this way of like looking opened up what the film was then going to be. So in a way, you said that you like the cinematography informed what the film, what, what the format of the film would be, rather than vice versa, which is how ninety eight percent of all the films are. Yeah, yeah, that's that sort of gets to a little bit of what we were talking about earlier, which was this intersection of the the subject of the movie and the and the aesthetic, you know. And so it was, you know, we we began we began exploring this idea of bringing to life online daters in New York, shooting sort of more conventional kind of interviewee stuff, and we shot we shot a little bit of people browsing the apps, but not, not so much in this intense close-up or even sort of medium close-up. And it was only in the process of experimenting and landing on that kind of image. And I, I forget the, the first person we shot. I think it was Kathleen who appears in the movie. Um, it was then that we got really excited and we realized, okay, maybe this could be a movie that's about online dating, but also asks the audience to almost participate in the, in the dating itself as well. And so that was kind of like a that was kind of like a, a conceit that unlocked the subject of the film in, in a certain sense. Which I, I think is brilliant because every time anyone is in a social situation showing somebody else what they're swiping through, everyone wants to participate. Sure. And see that, you know, and so I think it's a, this it kind of worked for me that way um, in the film. Yeah, cool. Yeah, no, it um it's very striking because yeah, the subjects are almost always looking at the camera lens. Um, you know, like you were saying, like it's a very personal um, way of, of, of presenting the subject. You know, it's kind of also a fourth wall breaking technique. It's almost uncinematic, I think at first, but then you, you get used to it. You start to connect with the people on the other side of the screen. You start to think of, um, you know, project, you know, uh, what they might be like, just kind of based on this, like one picture, this one image that you have um, of them, which like you were saying is, is very participatory almost in a way, like, you know, when you're, I guess, when you're uh, you know, looking at someone's dating profile or um, pictures of someone online. Um, 
and I'm wondering, like, did did the did the did framing people in this way versus um, maybe going a little bit more verite, more because I noticed you do have some two shots, some more standard documentary like interview setups. Like, did people behave differently, um, or um, did their attitudes change, like based on how you were shooting them? Well, I, I, I think when we were shooting, you know, oftentimes we would shoot browsing sessions and then we'd shoot a, what was clearly more of like a conversation between Pacho and the subjects. And I think people mm -hmm. are just like somehow intuitively more comfortable with the conversations. Um, and so, um, you know, the browsing sessions took, it would usually take, I mean, we'd usually shoot something like 15 to 30 minutes with each person and it would usually take, um, a significant amount of time before people really settled into the kind of naturalness of it. You know, it was always sort of this, like, um, it was always sort of like a little bit uncomfortable for people at first. I'd, I'd actually be curious to know it's worth, it's worth kind of figuring out what sections of the takes were used. I wouldn't be shocked if they skew towards the sort of second half of most of the interviews. Um, but at the same time, I think like the process was so engaging of just like browsing. I mean, it was a real browsing session. There was nothing faked. And I think it was just so engaging for people that they were able to eventually slip into this kind of rote process that they're used to when they're lying in bed, you know, on their, on their dating apps. Um, but I, yeah, Martin, I don't know if you, you noticed any other differences because you shot a few more, like towards the end, you shot a few more sort of conventional interviewee stuff that makes up the second half of the film in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, there's a lot of two shots. Some of the, I mean, some of the two shots that I was on, yeah, keep in mind that most of these people that we were filming with were all strangers to Pacho. Um, and so, or, and, and the crew. So, they were found in many different ways, but they weren't familiar people to the film crew. And um, I think for a lot of it, especially after COVID, it was like, after COVID started, it's not over. Um, there were a lot of people that were like, okay, yes, I agree. I'm gonna have this film crew come into my apartment, but I'm gonna have my, out. is it cool if I have my friend with me? So there was a lot of um, people wanted their friend, their, not only for familiarity, like um, with this film crew coming in, but also it's, I think, something that um, that often friends do together is swipe. And so sometimes they would say, oh, well, I usually swipe with my friend or I, I'm very close with my friend to talk about my dating life. So do you mind if they're in the film? And so we would always go in knowing that this was gonna happen. Um, and I, it's interesting, like, I, I'm interested that you say, Ian, that like the two shot is like um, a, a more like traditional documentary frame rather than a, a, a single of, of people swiping. Well, I mean, just the, like the looking directly into the, to the, uh, the camera lens though, is, is what I think was jarring. I mean, especially like when you first start the film and it's the, um, uh, the very first, the very first thing you see is um, there's just like this face and a huge close up, like staring you right in the eyes, and it's like uh, uh, you just you, you kind of sit back a little bit because it's not what you expect. Um, you expect to be as a viewer the fly on the wall, um, but not with this film. It, it's it feels different. Um, you know, there there's there are two people uh, involved in the looking. Um, yeah, well, I think that you had shot that, Daniel, with that first, I forgot the guy's name, but the first guy who's looking at is there's this long pause he has, and you don't really know what the hell this yeah. film is about yet. Um, but like, I, I really liked, because you had come up with the concept of this with using um, the eye direct as, as um, for them looking in the lens, and I had used it previously. But I'd be interested, Ian, you're much more studied than I am and you too, Daniel, but like you had brought up this idea about breaking the fourth wall and I have always thought about um, the history of, especially documentary, but 
before Aaron Morris like did this Interatron thing that like has been has been has been replicated. Um, like is that is is just the act of looking into the lens breaking the fourth wall just by looking at it. Um, it's an interesting thing to like to to think about, especially in terms of documentary. I mean, I think it is, you know, to me, that's to me, like, I mean, I guess in less so in documentary than in narrative, it's not like, rather, I should say, it's like, it's not so fourth wall breaking in documentary um, as it would be like in a narrative. Um, but I mean, just again, that first shot of like them looking into the camera, like, like you would look into um they're looking into their screen the way you would look into your screen. Um, I, I, actually, speaking of the Interatron, though, um, I noticed like an, kind of an Interatron looking contraption um, in the background. I think it was the scene where Pacho is setting up his dating profile. Uh, um, is that is that how you is that what you use to shoot all of those those single close ups? Yeah, yeah, we used we used an eye direct, um, which is a sort of lower budget in Teratron that um, is cool because it allows, you know, it has a sort of mirror configuration that allows for its conventional use, which is, um, you know, to have a director speak directly to the subject and the subject look back through the lens. But it also can accommodate like a, a teleprompter mode where it uses a, an iPad to project typically like, you know, words on the lens um, so it can be used in that way. And that's, so that's what allowed us to then, it was like actually quite a complicated system that I won't bore you with the details of, but that's what allowed us to basically run them, their browsing apps through the iPad and onto the lens. Um, yeah. And from a, a cinematographic um, standpoint, like how did, what was, um, what did Pacho want these, these close-ups, these singles to look like? And then um, how did you film them? Like in terms of the cameras and the lenses that you used? Well, um, I, I think most importantly, Pacho wanted a kind of naturalness and a kind of intimacy born of that naturalness. So, you know, of course we did a little bit of lighting but it was all in service of, um, again, of, of a kind of natural look and of, you know, we, it was also really important to Pacho that these portraits also add up to a kind of collective portrait of the, of the city itself. And so you had obviously the, the interludes that Martin shot, but also in some of the frames, it was, I think it was important to Pacho to get some of the texture of the different spaces we were moving between to make them feel sort of distinct. Um, so that meant, you know, a lot of kind of sort of the subjects would often be centered, but a sense of kind of like an open frame where you have a sense of the world beyond the frame. It wasn't these necessarily these perfect clean compositions, but it was nice to catch details of people's apartments in the background or, or if they're on a rooftop, you know, a, a subway train in the distance. Um, uh, and then, I mean, Martin, in terms of lenses and camera, maybe maybe you could speak better to that, some of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, you, we, I mean, we had used basically one, I mean, we shot on one lens the whole film, um, or well, I'll say one family. Um, every single, um, every single interview, every single kind of person swiping, every searcher was shot on the, the Zeiss 28 to 80 compact zoom. Um, and, and then um, outside shooting on the streets in New York, it was it was with that lens or um, it's it's um, rather in uh, the 70 to 200 compact zoom. And we had shot basically, you know, I think it was every every single scene is shot with those two lenses. Um, but we had shot with the um, the C3 Canon C300 Mark Mark II, which um, I don't know about you, Daniel, but I've like worked. I would say like in the last couple of years, it's been like the the camera that almost every documentary filmmaker in New York is using. Um, and 
I don't say that to plug them. It's just like, it's just has become the, the workhorse um, in the last few years. And yeah, I mean, I forgot the question now, but yeah, those were <laughs> yeah. Just, like, what, yeah. Look, just about the look and the lenses and the camera and sort of- the I mean, look, like it's, it's really funny. I've, Ian, I've, I've like kind of had grown up, I've read so many of your articles for many years and I'm always, like, I always like the beginning of many of their AC articles and they talk about like why they picked a camera. And what, like, I'm so often not allowed to pick a camera um, because in the documentary world, like you're working with whatever you have and whatever you can get your hands on, that's what you're shooting your film with. And that's also, I totally embrace that idea. Like that's what people should be doing. and. It just so happens that Pacho had had the C300 Mark II. And so when he initially had talked to me about shooting the film, I was like, well, what are, you, what are we shooting on? Thinking it was gonna be a DSLR. And he was like, oh yeah, I have a C300 Mark, Mark II and then the Zeiss lens. And I was like, great, we're set. And he's like, do you think we need to get like something else? And I was like, no, we're set. Like, like that's as, as much as I can ask for for a super low budget film. And I think there's a lot of like, I, I, I think the genius of the visuals in this film was not in, in choosing a lens camera combo, but rather actually with Daniel, with you and Pacho figuring out the hardware of how to, how to um, put this, this screen, the swiping on, onto like, this onto the lens basically because you're being very modest i have heard that you did create a hardware program and you and you did well, actually like program be, to be to make this happen i would be remiss if i didn't shout out uh milo who is a producer on this film and he, he yes he collectively all, all three of us figured out this again this sort of convoluted way of i mean the the, the short of it was that you had to you had to get a, you had to simultaneously project, operate and screen capture this browsing session, which meant you had to run a mobile app on a laptop computer and then send it to the iPad, but send it reversed because then the iDirect would then mirror it to the subject. So Milo, you know, Milo deputized some friend to like program something on the Mac that reversed the image and figured out a some sort of simulator to run the mobile app. But, um, but yeah, it was like sort of a, a cool low budget technical feat if I do say so myself. And uh, yeah, I think that was uh, something to be very proud of in the film that we figured that out. Um, in a way, this, this isn't just a film about searching for love. It's also uh, deliberately or otherwise. Um, but it's also kind of a, a film about the way, one way uh, technology is used to mediate real human experiences. Um, and I think on that note, um, how does putting a camera between you and the subject affect your perception of the subject? I mean, I have to say that, um it's it's a wall it's a wall and as much as um i don't know i i have this like i always read people saying how handheld uh like hand like handheld makes things more intimate and i always think let's just talk about documentary here which and by when i say documentary i mean filming people who are not actors um I always read this thing about like handheld is more intimate and I'm like, how is that more intimate? The person, the person in front of the lens doesn't feel like it's more intimate. It would be more intimate if there was no camera there. And so I've always like viewed a camera as a wall that immediately gets put up and, and, the, and your interaction as a camera person is about like climbing over the wall or to the side or however you can do it in, and then connect with them. Um, so it's about like getting over this obstacle to connect with them, but then the benefit is that you have this connection filmed. Um, 
I, I just think it's a weird thing um, for two people to, to have in between them as a camera, whether it be the C300 or whether it be an iPhone, like a camera in front of people is a wall for me. And I think the, the, like, the interesting thing is like figuring out the way to connect with the people out, like outside of this, this wall. Yeah, I mean, the, the only other thing to add is, is something you sort of alluded to, Ian, which is that increasingly today, cameras are mediating what are fairly intimate interactions. Um, and so I think it's a sort of squirrely way of answering your question, but I do think that the film was in some ways calling attention to this very question in the sense that, you know, online dating happens after a series of lenses capture images and project them through screens. And so somehow like the film was about this very idea and about the, the, the lens and about the screen as this kind of, as the series of layers that stand between two people looking for love or someone making a film or someone looking for love while simultaneously making a film about it as is the case with, uh, with Pacho. Was he, was he like, was he um, seriously um, like uh, looking, uh, searching um, for, uh, while the film was being made or was it, uh, was he searching, uh, was he using these apps, you know, for the benefit of the film? And I guess, did, did he ever find anyone? <laughs> I could say he definitely was searching while the yeah. production was going on. It's addictive. I can, it can be. I haven't tried it in a long time. <laughs> I, I have a four-year-old daughter. <laughs> yeah. I mean, keep in mind, Daniel, I don't know when, when was the first time you had worked on this? I mean, uh, the film had been shot basically some, sometime in 2019. Yeah, it was, we began at the summer of, of 2019. And Pacho, yeah, Pacho was very much single. And um, I mean, his attraction to the subject in the first place was that this was like a something that was just a part of his life and a source of anxiety um, as well. Um, I'll let Pacho speak to sort of like his, his uh, feelings about online dating and his own, his own pursuits. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's fair to say it was very much a genuine, he was genuinely searching during this, this time period, some of which we were able to capture. Um, one of the one of your interviewees said that if, if you want to see the truth about a person, you have to find the worst picture of them. Do you do you uh, agree with that? Do you agree with that assessment? I would say so. I would I would definitely say so. But it's 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 a weird thing. Like I had thought about once while we were filming was that like these people who these people who are swiping they've presented themselves in the best way that they think they have done on their profile. But we are filming them. And for, for most everybody, nobody like did anything special to be, to sit down in front of the camera. Um, and so I was like, I was thinking about this, how like, oh, they're presenting a different person on their dating profile versus how they are getting filmed, swiping as that dating profile. So in a way, it's like they were representing two different people. Mm. Yeah. It's funny, I guess, like you talked about, um, Martin, you talked about filming non-actors, but, you know, does, do you find that once a person knows they're on camera, they become uh, a kind of actor? I mean, I think that, I mean, I would say that it depends if they're used to being paid attention to. Um, and that could mean they're used to having a camera stuck in their face. Uh, and when I say camera, let's say, I'll just say a phone. If they're used to being f like having their photo taken by friends, that's being paid attention to. But I think it's also a thing that if you're, if you grew up in a family or in a society that doesn't, you're in a place that you're not being paid attention to. Bringing a camera into the mix suddenly makes you feel different, right? So I don't know if it's performing 
for a camera because you you know that you're like used to watching things in media versus performing because you're getting paid attention to it. Um, I think that, I mean, it's, I think it starts when we're children. I think we, you get called on in school and you suddenly, your posture corrects itself. You correct your posture and you, you, you answer in the official voice, whatever it is, you know, you weren't used, you weren't like ready for the teacher to call on you, but then when it is, that's your, that's your like answer voice. And I think that is a performative way of speaking as well. And so I think, yeah, I mean, everyone's performing all the time when they're in front of a camera. So I just don't think that the end goal is that they are looking to be perceived a certain way. I think it's just an innate kind of, there's a spotlight on me, whether that be a camera or whether that be someone else's attention that makes you perform. I will just add that, you know, th thinking back to the, to the, the process of shooting and then the final film, there were these sort of like moments of slippage where sort of people became aware of themselves as characters. They sort of became self-conscious. I think it had something to do with the fact that as, as I said, at some point, the browsing of the, of the dating profiles became so absorbing that they really did lose themselves in it. And so you'd have characters snap out of it suddenly and say, Oh my God, like I'm going to appear so judgy by doing this. So what, what was nice about the film and just about the, the structure of the shoot was that there, there was this kind of opportunity as, as much as is possible in front of a camera um, for people to sort of slip into themselves a little bit. And I think it had to do with the distraction of the, of the, the mechanism in front of them. Well, it, it is an incredibly revealing film, I think, in, in many ways about, again, the technology we use to, to mediate our lives and, and the things we look for when we're looking for love. And um, again, congratulations on, on having it premiere uh, this Saturday, January 30th, in the next program at the Sundance Film Festival uh, 2021. And so uh, I want to thank, thank again, uh, Daniel Claridge and... Uh, and Martin DeChico, cinematographers for Searchers, uh, for joining us here at the Canon Creative Studio.